Now, I'm very excited to announce our next speaker, Neil Power, who will be having a conversation with Gab Columbro, the executive director at Finos. Uh, Neil is the technology leader and veteran of the financial industry. As CTO, he led engineering at Quant Funds, AQR, and DE Shaw, and as CIO, steered large technology organizations at UBS and most recently Deutsche Bank. He is an absolute advocate for open source and is proud of AQR's decision to open source Pandas back in 2008. Uh, he's been a recurring member of the Institutional Investor Top 50 in Tech list and is currently working with technology startups as a board member, advisor, and investor. And we are absolutely delighted to have him here today for this once in a conference opportunity. No, really, it will only be this once. So please welcome Neil Pawar and Gab Kalumbro. Hey, Neil, it's uh, great to have you here. Um, not only because I'm really looking forward to hear, uh, you know, to hearing from you uh, about the financial services landscape, but I know you have pretty strong views on open source as well. So um, just, just as an anecdote, I, I came across Neil uh, as I was listening to a podcast once uh, called Power to the People, which I think it was a pretty clever name. Uh, but that's what I, you know, for the first time I came across Neil and I, you know, I heard this very senior technologist talking about open source and that was, you know, a few years ago, a very different time. So, uh, Neil, uh, we, we've been collaborating now for, you know, a couple of years uh, as you were CTO of AQR and then uh, in your uh, role as CIO at Deutsche Bank. Um, you know, it was about two years ago. I'm, I'm a little bit scared of asking the question given, you know, 2020, but how's, how's 2020 been treating you? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me, Gab. It's great to be here. And uh, look, I'm, I'm very fortunate that 2020 um, has been good for me and my family in the context of things. I mean, we've managed to stay safe and relatively sane during, uh, you know, what can only be described as an incredibly challenging time. Um, it's been sort of interesting, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mountain biker and I bike in New York City as well, which is where I live. I'm, I'm, I'm in my basement in Brooklyn as we speak. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed in New York and my, my family in London tells me the same is that, you know, we're seeing a lot more creation of bike lanes and pedestrian zones. And so yeah. for all of the negative things, obviously, um, that have come out of COVID, it's also really interesting to see some of the positive things that have come out of it as well. And I, you know, when I think about it, I think that the same can 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 hold true for finance. You know, um, sort of COVID has accelerated the importance of digital transformation for sure. And if you think about us living in a time where budgets are smaller and spreads are tighter and fees are being compressed and margins are being compressed, um, you know, uh, that's really challenging to come and transform your technology into a digital world uh on a budget and so i think there's some really interesting sort of challenges ahead of us and covid's only going to accelerate them. well that's that's fascinating but let, let me drill down a little bit onto this sometimes somewhat amorphous concept of of digital transformation um i just want to try to unpack it for a second uh you know just to split the the buzzword from the actual substance there um, you know, there's no doubt, as you say, that, that um, the industry is undergoing a major change. And, you know, we certainly have seen uh, COVID accelerating the, you know, this process in many respects. Uh, many respects, I mean, on our side, you know, we've seen firms being much more comfortable, of course, with remote working, with distributed teams, which, you know, of course, is really how open source is made. Uh, and, and, you know, that has turned into ma major uptake of open source contributions from banks in our community. But, you know, how do you think the industry is doing more broadly with this, you know, digitalization in achieving this digitalization? It, it's an interesting word, digitalization, because I, I've asked a lot of um, senior executives across the industry what it means to them. And I get very different answers. And so I decided to sort of think about it for myself for a bit. and. You know, ultimately, the way I've been trying to explain visualization to people is that really it's doing things with data. And so I think one of the side effects of, of wanting to, you know, be more digital 
forcing firms to think about their data strategy and how they address data internally. Now, obviously, there's, a, I think, a super important element of digitalization that also has a lot to do with operations and, and process. But I think getting the data right is key. And so if you, if you sort of couple that with, you know, we want to get our data right. We also want to start moving off some of our legacy infrastructures like mainframes and, and moving to more modern things like cloud. It really tells you that uh, we can't just do this by, by reaching in and sort of fixing our data in the, um, you know, in the legacy systems. There'll be many places where we need to re-engineer. And I think when you think about re-engineering in the year 2020, you really have to ask yourself, you know, the sort of the, the question that we've asked ourselves in the past around buy versus build. Um, but I've stopped using the phrase buy versus build because I feel like, first of all, it, it doesn't necessarily include open source. Uh, and so I've been using the phrase um, leverage versus invent. Hmm. And I think that if you're posed with this challenge, if I want to start to get out of the world I've been in, and I want to be more data oriented and more digital, uh, I've got to change something. And if I'm going to change things, do I want to reinvent everything myself or do I want to reuse wherever I can? And I think that teases up for a really interesting, you know, next three to five years. Um, you know, I was really encouraged to see what Goldman's done through the open sourcing of Legend. I think that's, that's phenomenal. And just reading about how that's starting to be used now by other uh, members of Finos, I think is, is really cool. So, you know, there's no doubt that, um, you know, the incumbents by, by contributing things that they've built to the open source community is going to be a much better way than all of us sitting down with a blank slate and trying to, by committee, design what the future looks like. And so I think there's a lot of very promising um, things happening, but, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done as well. That's so true. And, you know, thanks, thanks for calling out the legend contribution from Goldman Sachs. It's been, you know, hard work for us uh, and for the Goldman team, which I, you know, of course, I, I send the biggest shout out to. But, um, you know, I just wanted to point out there, I think we are absolutely on the same page when it comes to uh, A, you know, contribution from banks, let's not reinvent the wheel. That's really the ethos of open source. But what we have seen as well is that, you know, it's not only the value of, you know, taking software, being able to adopt it, you know, software that becomes more and more commoditized. Um, but we were pretty encouraged by hosting at Finos, an instance of legend, which allowed actually our banks to, uh, not just banks, but regulators and, uh, uh, other, pretty much any constituents to be invited and participate and collaborate directly on the model themselves, which, uh, you know, I think opens up pretty, pretty interesting, uh, um, you know, opportunities, even for those firms that are maybe not necessarily ready, uh, you know, to do full blown open source. Uh, but, you know, how do you, why, why do you think we're seeing so, that, so much sort of readiness at this point for, for the industry? Um, you know, to, to have this industry-wide collaboration through open source? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still in its early um, stages, but I think, first of all, I, I have to commend what, what, what all of you have been up to at Finos over the last, you know, four or five years now. I think you've taken the term open source and made it less scary to incumbents, particularly to sort of, you know, um, uh, legal and compliance functions that obviously had a, a, a hurdle to get over in terms of understanding how it's done and how to do it in, in a way that protects the intellectual property of the firms that they're there to, uh, to represent. So I think, first of all, there's a, there's a much better foundation now than perhaps there was five years ago to even try out some of these things. But I think also there's a reality sinking in, which is the opportunity cost of engineers is incredibly high. And so if you have a limited number of engineers to solve a problem, you want to focus them on the, the parts that most differentiate you. And so, you know, I think what we're starting to see is a lot more services pop up that, um, that we've solved ourselves over the last 25 years, right? So if you think about 
you know, I'll throw some examples out there, but like fund administration in a pre-Bernie Madoff world, um, everybody did it themselves for the most part. In the post-Bernie Madoff world, you, you needed to use a third party fund administrator. Now there, there was the catalyst of the, the Madoff Ponzi scheme, but, but the same is true when you think about fund accounting, when you think about KYC, I mean, there's many parts of the post-trade world um, of a bank or an asset manager that now vendors are starting to offer not just software, but the entire service. And so I think, again, to use that, that phrase leverage versus intent, I think we're starting to see um, people more willing to, whether it's for cost reasons or for reducing the friction that, you know, in the straight through processing, they're more open to that. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you couple that with the fact that you know, as an engineer and as a technologist last, last you know, a couple of decades, one thing I'm embarrassed about is that we, you know, the, the, the cost of migrating off of a platform and onto a new one, whether you've built it or you've bought it or, or it's open source, is incredibly high. It yeah. takes a long time. It's very risky. And as a result, a lot of leaders choose not to do it because they frankly don't want to carry that risk. And I don't blame them. I mean, given how, how often those things fail. So I think that there's, you know, work that needs to be done to make those migration costs and risks, you know, lower. And that's where I think data standards, protocols, semantics become super important. And, um, you know, this is where I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, the open source community can come together and, and, and really drive some of those standards. Like I said, not inventing them from the ground up, but, but potentially taking what others have out there that they're contributing to uh, to the open source platform and, and building around that. So um, that was rather a mouthful. Let me pause and see if uh, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. I I, um, I think I'm you know uh, I've seen a lot of um, I would say new strategic approaches to open source that kind of you know pair up the. Um, data strategy with their sort of search for efficiency, you know, definitely, uh, you know, I can echo the thought that um, I think we're past those hurdles uh, of legal and compliance. Again, not in the, you know, 100% of, of constituents of this industry, but certainly most of the incumbents we've seen sort of going through that. Uh, and now, you know, there's much more strategic thinking around how do we leverage this to, again, have a better data strategy, interoperability, efficiency. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't have said it in, in, a, in a better way. Um, as, as I think about the constituents in, in this industry, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, banks contributing and sort of the, the, the reasons and the drivers that they are uh, you know, looking at open source as part of the, the, the digital transformation. But um, how about fintechs? Um, I think, you know, through open source, we think we're we are creating a level playing field here. Um, how do you think, you know, the fintechs can sort of leverage and participate uh, to this community? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that... Um... The fintechs have a big part to play because when you think about, if you buy the argument that the continued commoditization of the core things that financial service firms do that are not differentiated, right? So let's put aside alpha generation and market making and the core businesses, and let's think about yeah. all the other things you need to do to comply and run in a regulated environment. Um, you know, the fintechs offer a lot of those, whether they offer the software around that or whether they offer services around that. And so for them to be more widely adopted to the extent that, you know, I mean, I think they have an incentive to adopt standards uh, in the open source community as well, because as those standards actually become more predominant, the ability to get to this point in the future where you could say, I've outsourced KYC to vendor X, but tomorrow, Vendor Y comes along and says, I, I think we've got a better platform, better AI, better ability to find the, the, the needle in the haystack. You yep. say, well, if I can just turn my pipes to that other vendor and get that feedback loop and compare it, um, it's kind of a no-brainer to try that out. The problem is today you can't just turn the pipes. That's a massive implementation project. And so I think 
you know, there's a there's an aligned set of incentives between uh, the fintechs, the incumbents, the regulators, and the open source community that kind of glues a lot of that together. And, uh, you know, I'm really hopeful that we're at a point now in the sort of maturity of open source within financial services combined with the, you know, the imperative to do something about it quickly, that the alignment of incentives across the different players may be at the best point it's been in the last 20, 30 years. That's really encouraging coming from you, Neil. Um, <laughs> I... I... Yeah, I definitely see a major opportunity here for the fintechs. Um, there's, there's, you know, if I think about other industries and how they have, you know, there's massive, you know, commercial open source ecosystems built around, I don't know, big data, cloud itself. Um, you know, if you pair that up with a, you know, an industry that is still largely pretty siloed in terms of the vendors and the vendors relationship, I feel there's there's major opportunity here, um, you know, as we sort of create the 11th playing field, create, again, reduce the barriers sometimes to, to, to access this industry. Actually, on this note, uh, you know, Tosh announced this morning uh, uh, our Open RegTech initiative. I don't know if you, uh, uh, you know, got a chance to, to take a peek at it. Uh, we're certainly pretty excited because we think involving regulators uh, you know, now also with a special interest group, uh, you know, early on in the uh, idea that, you know, you could use open source and even common standards, uh, you know, to simplify, if you want, the, the, the whole uh, uh, regulatory process, it's certainly a powerful one. And kind of, again, to what we just said about fintechs, it definitely sort of reduces the barrier of entry. What's what's your feedback on that? What's your what's your thought on uh, open source regulation? Yeah, you know, I I was looking recently at um, LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier. And this is um, sort of a standard that's been driven by the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, which as most of you know, is sort of endorsed by the G20 and a, and a really legitimate body around this. Yep. And, um, it's fascinating, right? I mean, as, as somebody who over the years has seen legal entity masters come and go and the mapping and, and the challenge of knowing, you know, which entity is this, you know, there, there were days when we used to book trades where we would say the counterparty was Goldman, you know, or Lehman. And then when something like Lehman actually happened, when they blew up, um, the ability to figure out which legal entity had you actually traded with and is it one that's gone bankrupt or not was incredibly hard to do in 2000. And so the idea of having sort of a global standard around legal entity identifier, a global database that you can actually query that is one of the definitive sources. And the key to all of that being that in Europe now, you are required, which is such an important catalyst, you know, and we'd love to see that in other parts of the world as well, because all of these standards reduce the friction of straight through processing transactions across the financial system. So I think that it's, Phenomenal news that, that that there's a regulatory angle to spin us. And I think that there's good examples already out there of where bodies have helped drive some of that standardization and then the reduction of friction off the back of that. Um, and this will give us an opportunity to get the right people in the room to, to build on that. Yeah, we're really, we're really hopeful and we've seen such an early momentum that, you know, it seems we're onto something here. Um, so Neil, this this has been really interesting. Um, before I let you go, um, you know we, we're really proud of what we achieved uh, uh, as an industry in having so many contributions from banks. We we sort of think this as a you know an important stepping stone for us, um, but definitely mm, by far not the end of the road. Uh, and so you know, in your eyes, where where do we go from here? Well, I, I think there's people a lot more qualified than me to answer that question uh, here at this conference. You're being too humble. <laughs> but my, my two cents would be, look, I, while I think we're in the early innings, uh, I think we have an amazing opportunity to really go for it. I think that, you know, just from the vantage point I've had over the last couple of decades, you can see the financial system has less money than it did to invest in upgrading and differentiating. 
And so if we're going to do it, we got to be really careful and thoughtful in how we do it. And that means basically using the opportunity to, to collaborate on the things that we don't necessarily compete on. Um, and I think, you know, as you say, the silos that have existed, not just across the industry, but frankly, even within incumbent firms in the industry, you know, breaking those down and using the sort of catalyst of data and migration to a new way of compute and storage as ways of now, while we're doing that, let's not bring some of the mistakes that we made when we were digitalizing in the 90s into 2020. And by yep. the way, I don't think they were mistakes made in the 90s because we were silly or, or we weren't clever enough. I think it was, you know, it was brand new. Finance was one of the first industries to really digitalize, if you think about it. And we're so digital that 30 years later, we have a ton of legacy digital lying around that we want to upgrade to modern digital. And so yep. I think that's an imperative that everyone's facing at this point. And um, there's clearly parts of that ecosystem that none of us need to own. And in fact, if we can actually get it to the point where none of us own it, then it really starts to open up that ecosystem to a different level of competition, a different level of switching costs. Uh, and I think that'll put all of us in a, in, in a better place. So, uh, so I'm really excited about the conference. I'm really excited about how you've organized it. And just more importantly, just really appreciative of everybody that, that, that participates in this because it's what's going to allow us to do some of the things that you and I have talked about on this uh, on this session today. Well said, Neil. I, I, our kudos have to go to our community who, you know, continues to, uh, you know, put sweat equity and effort in, in what we do every day. So very well said. <clears throat> um, and with that, uh, Neil, Thank you so much for your time and for your uh, very thoughtful input. Uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation uh, in a year from now, and hopefully we can, uh, uh, you know, sing some victories. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to look back on whether anything that we said actually happened. But uh, no, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you about this. It's a it's a topic I care tremendously about, and um, yeah, really many thanks to all the participants of the conference for for caring about this and for helping push it forward is such an important topic. So thanks. Thank you so much, Neil. And by the way, I'm going to use leverage versus invent in the proper open source style, uh, uh, unless there's a trademark over it, isn't no, it? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye-bye.